there. My name is Dr Louise Ewing. I'm a lecturer in the School of Psychology at the University of East Anglia and I'm thrilled to be with you all today as part of the Norwich Science Festival. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my particular passion for science, hopefully winning you over to the idea that it might be something interesting to think about and study. And I'm going to tell you about a fun activity that you can do yourselves if you'd like to participate in a real-life science experiment. Now, I'm a psychologist, which means I'm a scientist that studies humans like you. My colleagues and I work to understand how people's minds work, how it is that we're able to do amazing things like understand and use language, control our attention to focus on some things and not others, and learn and remember loads of complicated new information and skills. These things might seem really straightforward, but are actually super complicated. We all know that our bodies change a lot from when we're born to become children, adults, and then older adults. And we psychologists want to better understand what's going on in our minds that might be also changing at the same time. One of the things I'm particularly interested in is how people of different ages read information from faces. Now, you might think faces are a bit of a funny thing to study, but they're actually incredible sources of information for us. When we look at someone's face, we can extract a lot of information about a person. Looking at my face, you can tell my age, well, near enough. Maybe you can tell whether I'm male or female. You could make a guess about my background and where I'm from. You could also make guesses about things like whether I'm healthy, trustworthy, smart, friendly, and lots of other things too. And once you get to know me, you're very unlikely to get me confused with anybody else. Now, that's all really impressive because even though we can see so much in every face that we come across, they're actually really similar to each other. If you think about it, they're all made up of basically the same bits in basically the same arrangement. We all have two eyes over a nose over a mouth. And when you look closely, those face parts look very similar in one person and another. Nobody has a nose that's all that different from everybody else's nose. And even though some people have blue eyes and others might have brown, they're really all still pretty similar from one person to another. So to make a long story short, all this face reading seems like it should be pretty difficult. But for most of us, it's not. People like me are working to better understand the way in which our brain solves the challenge of reading information from faces. And we've learned a lot from doing experiments. Here's an example. So I've got a couple of pictures here of one of my absolutely favourite people, David Attenborough. If you're watching this video and love science and nature, then you'll probably be a fan of him as well. Now, I bet you could identify him and tell his face apart from loads of others. And it wouldn't matter if he was brightly lit or in the dark or smiling or frowning or young or old. Now, once again, that might not feel like it's anything special, but it's actually really cool. You wouldn't be nearly so confident about doing all that with a chair, for example. It would be much harder to recognise when you see it from different angles and in different places, even a chair you knew really well. Now, interestingly, it seems like things aren't quite the same when faces are turned upside down. Even when the picture and the information that's available for your eyes and brain is exactly the same, the task of reading things like identity, who someone is, becomes much harder when it's not the right way up. And in fact, we're so insensitive to what's going on in upside down faces that most of you probably haven't even noticed that there's something a bit funny about this picture. When it's upside down, you can't see anything weird about it, but when it's the right way up, it looks quite strange. That's because we've flipped around the eyes and the mouth. And now it looks quite horrible, right? It's so strange to think that we couldn't see anything that was weird about it before. Now, to be clear, I'm not just being mean to David. This effect is actually a really classic perceptual phenomenon that was first demonstrated in experiments in the 1980s, which revealed just how special our abilities are, not just generally for faces, but specifically for upright faces, the ones we usually see when we're out in the world. So, obviously, I'm a big old face nerd. I'm obsessed with them but I'm not alone. Research indicates that most humans are pretty big face fans. We love looking at them. Artists are drawn to paint them, photographers are drawn to photograph them, and when we're looking at pretty much any scene with people in them, 
Eye tracking studies that record where people are looking consistently show that our focus of attention is strongly captured by faces. It's like we can't help but look at them. And this particular interest in faces is seen very early in life. Babies have been shown to be drawn to look at facey looking things from just after birth, pretty much as soon as we open our eyes to see. They use quite a neat experiment to work this out. They lay newborns down in their laps and waved different types of paddles in front of them to see which ones they would follow the longest with their eyes. Now some of the paddles looked like faces in a very basic way and the baby showed a preference to look at these longer than all the others. So we're spending a lot of time looking at faces and from a very young age. We could think about that like practice or training though it's a little bit different to when we're learning to ride a bike or shoot a basketball, because making judgments about faces feels like such a natural thing to do. Still, practice does tend to make perfect, which is likely a big part of how we get so good. There's evidence also that all this experience with faces drives specialisation in our brains that further helps us process faces. When we use brain scanning equipment to make recordings and take images of what's going on inside our heads, we've learned that there's a special network of regions in the brain that seem to be recruited to help us read faces so well. We know that because during experiments, those parts are activated and light up in our scans when people are looking at faces and not at other things. So, in light of all that, maybe it isn't quite so surprising that we're such face experts and see them everywhere, even sometimes when there's nothing actually to see. Have you ever had that happen? Seen a face in the clouds or perhaps in the pattern of a bark on a tree? This is called face pareidolia. It's a very common illusion or trick that's played by our eyes in our brain. And it's great fun. Some of the examples really crack me up like these ones here. And face pareidolia is also cool because it highlights some interesting things about human psychology. Like, we are busy people. Our brains have a lot to do. And psychologists have learned that sometimes we take mental shortcuts based on things we call heuristics, because it's good to be able to solve problems and make judgments quickly without necessarily gathering all the information we might need or stopping to think carefully about what's going on. The downside is sometimes these mental shortcuts can steer us wrong. And face pareidolia is a nice example of this. We have a great system that's set up for recognising faces and lots of experience every day out in the world seeing things that look like faces that are faces. So when we see something like this with elements that are a little face-like, we can get the strong impression of a face and some of those special brain regions light up like they've seen a face, even though obviously it's really a pole. And I think it's kind of interesting to think that even though the face pareidolia illusion is sometimes leading us to make mistakes, maybe it's still a good thing. Because faces are important after all. Whether they're on people or even on animals, we want to know when they're around. Either because it's a friend to say hi to, or something tasty to catch and eat for dinner, or something scary that we need to be ready to run away from. It might be better to make a mistake sometimes and see faces that aren't really there, than to miss something that's really important, like a tiger. Now, my team and I are running an experiment to learn more about face pareidolia, particularly how it changes with age and experience. And we've designed a short task, takes no more than 10 minutes, and we're inviting any children aged five and over, and adults, so parents can get involved as well. To help out, all you need to do is follow the link that's posted at the end of this video. It will take you to a page with more information about the study, which is set up like a game and involves looking at pictures of a bunch of different things and making judgments about them, like whether or not you can see a face. It's a bit of fun, there's no right or wrong answers, and you'll be providing us with exciting new insights into how it is that we humans think and understand the world around us. So thanks in advance for helping out and for your attention today watching this video. That's all from me, bye. Good afternoon, my name's Camilla Ryan.
today's top news story. Huh? Yeah? What are zoos good for? Absolutely everything, it turns out. To tell us more, we now go live to our reporter in the field. Hello, Camilla. Thank you, Camilla. Yes, today I'm here at the wonderful Banham Zoo in the heart of East Anglia to find out, huh, yeah, what are zoos good for? And to give you some information into all the incredible work zoos do to help animals. So let's go. Now, I love animals. I always have. But a lot of animals are threatened and need our help. For example, I'm sure we've all heard of climate change and how this is causing some pretty extreme weather, which isn't good for us, our barbecues, but can be devastating for other wildlife. Now behind me in this enclosure, we have some emu and kangaroo, which are from Australia. Now Australia has been ravaged by bushfires, which have been increasing due to climate change. And these fires are estimated to have killed over one billion animals. But animals also suffer from pollutants in their habitat. And the habitat's what we call where an animal lives. Now these pollutants could be plastics or chemicals, or sometimes their habitat just gets destroyed completely. Behind me is a black and white rough lemur. Now all lemurs can only be found on the island of Madagascar, but their forest home is being destroyed because of illegal mining, illegal logging, or being cleared for agriculture. And this destruction has meant that almost every single species of lemur is threatened with extinction. But it doesn't end there. Some animals are even hunted illegally, and we call this poaching. For example, the red panda is poached for its beautiful red fur, which some people make into hats. Now, I'm no fashion expert, but I think the red panda wears it better. So all these things that threaten animals have one thing in common. They are caused in large part by humans. So it's up to us to come up with the solutions. And the word we use for trying to help everything in the environment is conservation. Now conservation means trying to save everything, not just the cute and furries, but the plants and insects and everything in between too. But why should you care? Well, if you're like me, you just do. Because I love nature and love wildlife, and I don't want to imagine a world without these incredible creatures in. But there is another reason that you should care, which is that we are all part of an ecosystem. And an ecosystem is everything you can see in your local environment and some things you can't, like the worms in the soil or the insects in the leaves. And everything in this ecosystem has a role that is needed to ensure that the ecosystem survives and that everything in the ecosystem survives, including us. Now, what do I mean by role? Well, I assume you're all fans of breathing. Well, without plants, we wouldn't be able to breathe because plants convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. I myself am a huge fan of food. And it's insects that pollinate a lot of our crops. So without insects, we wouldn't have a lot of the food that we enjoy. For example, without insects, there wouldn't be any chocolate digestives. Just imagine. So everything in an ecosystem has a role and it's important that we protect everything or the whole ecosystem could fall apart. In many ways, the ecosystem is like a giant game of Jenga, where each block is a different animal or plant. And if you remove too many blocks, the whole thing will collapse. In Victorian times, when people had big hats and bigger moustaches, saving an animal meant shooting it and then putting it in a collection like a museum so that everybody could see it and you'd saved it for mankind. But obviously, this didn't actually help the animals. Instead, conservation needs the help of dedicated individuals, governments, scientists, charities, and zoos. Now, people have been keeping collections of animals since before the ancient Egyptians, but the first zoos didn't come around until the 1700s. And they were not nice places for animals. They were more like living museums, with animals treated like exhibits crammed together in tiny cages. But zoos have come an awfully long way since then and today really value animal welfare, ensuring that their animals have great enclosures with enough space, in as natural a setting as possible, a proper diet, and enrichment so they don't get bored. Now, I want to make it very clear that the zoos we're talking about today are not zoos like this, which keep their animals in small cages and not very nice settings purely for human entertainment. Instead, we're talking about zoos like Banham, 
zoos that are run by highly trained and dedicated individuals who always put their animals first and usually a part of a zoo association which ensures that they meet the highest standard of animal welfare. But you might say to me, Camilla, I love a zoo as much as the next person. It doesn't mean they're helping animals. But the thing is, what you see when you visit the zoo is really only a small amount of all the work that zoos do to help animals. So, what do zoos do? Well, zoos can be the last hope for endangered animals. This is the golden frog, which confusingly isn't a frog but a toad. It's extinct in the wild and wouldn't be alive today if not for zoos. Found only in beautiful Panama in Central America, the golden frog had been decreasing for years because they were targeted by collectors for pets and a lot of their habitat was being destroyed to make ways for houses or farms and their rivers were getting polluted. Despite all this, they were still fairly easy to find. In 2001, scientists said that you could walk along 200 metres of river and easily see 20 to 30 frogs. However, in 2004, within the space of a few months, the Panama golden frog all but disappeared. And in fact, if you've seen Life in Cold Blood, that is the last time they were filmed in the wild. And this is because they were being killed by a fungus called the chytrid fungus, which is attacking frog, toads and all amphibians worldwide. Scientists made the decision to find as many of the remaining golden frogs as they could and put them in amphibian arcs, which was an initiative set up by zoos worldwide to help save all the amphibians at risk of this disease. Because of amphibian arcs, there are now over 500 golden frogs in captivity, and zoos also funded a specific centre in Panama dedicated to the conservation of the golden frog. And whilst they cannot be released because they would be killed by the fungus, scientists, together with zoos, are using this time to try and research and find a cure for this disease to help all frogs, and it is hoped in time that, that the golden frogs can be released. So whilst the golden frog can't be released back into its native habitat, many animals can, but just need a little bit of help. And this help often comes in the form of captive breeding and release programs. Now, captive breeding is where zoos will help animals have babies, make sure they grow up healthy and strong, and can be released back into the wild. And Banham Zoo has played its part in captive breeding and reintroduction. Now, behind me, we have a brown wood owl. And Banham actually helped with an reintroduction of another owl species called the Ural Owl. In 2019, Banham donated a pair of Ural Owls to a zoo in France. This pair had four owlets and these four owlets are part of a reintroduction program to reintroduce those owls back into forests in Bavaria where they've become locally extinct. As I already mentioned, zoos get involved in scientific research. For one thing, it's much easier for scientists like me to get samples from captive individuals rather than wild animals. I mean, imagine asking a leopard for a blood sample. But zoos routinely monitor their animals. And this means that a vet taking a blood sample for some routine medical monitoring can give some of this blood to scientists like me, and we can use this to study an animal's DNA and make sure it's healthy. But even if zoos don't get involved directly with the research themselves, they support so many projects in a variety of ways, whether this is raising funds or money, to education programs. Speaking of education, zoos help to inspire the next generation of scientists, conservationists and zookeepers and help people connect with and care for the natural world. I mean, I know that every time I visit a zoo, I come away having learned at least one new thing. For example, this is not a fox on stilts. It's actually the maned wolf, which confusingly is also not a wolf. But zoos aren't just responsible for educating members of the public. They're involved in community outreach programs, and education programs around the world. And zookeepers who are highly trained individuals and often specialists in the animals that they care for will travel around the world sharing this knowledge with other keepers and conservation projects. I'm joined today by animal manager Mike Woolham. Hello Mike, thank you for joining us. Hi. So we've been talking about the role that zoos play in helping to save animals. So I think the public has a right to know what animal is the cutest animal at Banham Zoo. It's very difficult, all animals are cute, but I think at the moment here, I would have to go for the Sri Lankan leopard cub. Um, baby animals bring out 
everyone's maternal and paternal instincts and yeah he's, he's a real cutie we will make sure to go and check him out if you visit make sure you go and have a look at the baby sri lankan leopards so what does banham do to make sure the animals stay happy and healthy well, keepers work very hard. It's not just about their physical well-being, it's also about their mental well-being. So the keepers uh, adopt a process called environmental enrichment, um, where they make sure that the animals receive novel items, sometimes, for example, like drag feeds or scent trails. Um, a, a, a great one is big cats um, love the smell of Calvin Klein perfume. So every now and again, we spray the enclosure with Calvin Klein perfume. Uh, yeah, it, it gets them to, to increase their scent marking, you know, territoriality behaviours. It's really good. So if anyone has any leftover perfume, they should send it your way? Yeah, we, we, to be fair, we have advertised in the past when we were running low and normally we get inundated. Um, so we're always grateful for, for old perfumes, you know, the sort of the end of a bottle, absolutely fine. Just stick it in the post um, and, and send it to us. Yeah, very much so. Fantastic. And am I right in saying that you have an Amazon wish list for people who want to contribute to animal enrichment? Yes, we do. Yeah. In fact, I think probably perfumes on that, um, but lots of other things as well. Yeah, no, we're always very grateful for anything off the wish list. Um, if people want to log on and, and you know see what's on there and send something to us, that we'd be very grateful. So, Mike, I know that you've been working in zoos for many years now. So, why do you think that zoos are important? I think, in some respects, we've lost our connectivity to nature. You know, we, we, zoos are in a unique position um, to enable people to reconnect with nature. Um, and also the animals that you see here are fantastic ambassadors for their species. You know, so many species now are endangered. I mean, it takes Sri Lankan leopards for, a, for, a, for an example. People may not realise that there are less than a thousand Sri Lankan leopards left in the wild. Um, and so it enables us to spread the words. And also we do fund um, in situ conservation projects. You know, vultures, lemurs, some of the world's most endangered species. Zoos all around the world are funding a lot of these projects, you know, helping to save these animals in the wild. Fantastic. All right, Mike, before you go, one last question. What is your favourite animal? Oh, that's really difficult. Um, <clears throat> When I was a zookeeper, I spent most of my time working with rhinos. We don't have rhinos uh, at Banham. Here, I think it would have to be the big cats, um, I think. But then again, I don't know. I really like the gelada baboons. But no, I think I'd have to go big cats. I think probably um, the tigers, I think. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been absolutely brilliant to hear about your point of view and the work that Banham does. Thank yes, you. Pleasure. So zoos clearly play an incredibly important role in helping to save animals. And there are a lot of animals alive today that wouldn't be if not for zoos. So, huh, yeah, what are zoos good for? Absolutely everything. I've been Camilla Ryan. Now back to you in the studio. Thank you, Camilla. Well, there you have it. Huh, yeah, what are zoos good for? Absolutely everything. But please remember during these trying times that zoos do need our support. So if you're able to support your local zoo, please do so. If it's safe for you, you to visit, please visit your local zoo. But remember your mask because you will need it for some of the exhibits. Perhaps you could make a donation or sponsor an animal or maybe buy them something off the Amazon wish list or contribute to a zoo through Amazon Smile. Because remember, when you're helping a zoo, you are helping animals all around the world. I've been Camilla Ryan, saying to you once more, huh, yeah, what are zoos good for? Absolutely everything. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Shaharyar Banuri. I'm an associate professor at the University of East Anglia. And today I'm here to talk to you about the psychology of video games. I'm standing here in Retro Replay, which is a video game arcade that is uh, a very important place for me growing up. You see, in the 1980s when I was growing up, if you wanted to play video games, you would come to places like these. In fact, these were really the only place where you could play video games. Nowadays, you can play them in your house, on your mobile phones, anywhere, but back then, 
arcades such as these were the only place where you could play video games. Now to my grandfather, standing outside of the arcade waiting for me to finish, video games were a child's hobby. Well, not any longer. The size of the video game industry is 120 billion pounds. It's actually bigger than the film industry as of last year. And about 2.7 billion people, that's 30, nearly a third of the global population, play video games of some sort or another. Um, we used to think that video games was just a child's hobby. In fact, only 21% of uh, video game players are under the age of 18, and more than 15% of video game players are over the age of 55. So that means that video games have become a global phenomena. You can play them anywhere you like. You can play them on phones, on your computers, in dedicated arcades, such as the one that I'm standing in. These have become serious business. So one of the questions is, how did video games get to be so big? And there's lots of answers to that question, but one key aspect is the role of psychology. Specifically, video games' unique ability in getting us to keep coming back and keep playing them. Okay? Now, the way that video games are able to do this is that they have small rewards built into their systems to reward you for effort. So the more you play, the more rewards that you get. This is what's called feedback. And video games is one unique industry where feedback and rewards happen almost instantaneously. So when you play, you get rewards, that makes you want to play some more, and so on and so on, leading to this $120 billion industry that we know today. Now, one of the primary ways that video games keep track of your progress is through points systems. So when you do something that the video game wants you to do, you get more points. Right? And these points are actually quite useful. They allow you to compete against yourself, keep track of how well you're doing. Um, they allow you to compete against your friends. And so you can think about uh, things like um, video games like Tetris, video games like Mario Brothers, uh, Space Invaders, Fortnite, The Last of Us, all of these games have some sort of sophisticated point systems that are keeping track of how well you're doing and giving you feedback at each point on how you're progressing throughout the game. And so what you do is you use these points to compete either against yourself or against your friends. Now, we at UEA were really interested in how this sort of competition affects uh, behavior. And so we invited uh, students to come uh, to our behavioral labs and we asked them to do a bunch of tasks. Now, for some of them, uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of the day, we told them how many tasks that they did. For others, we told them how many tasks they did, plus we gave them a ranking of how they ranked relative to other people. So what we were able to do was manipulate whether or not they would see their ranking or not, much like how video games uh, do the same thing, rank players against each other. Now, wouldn't you know it, for the people that got to see their rankings and knew that they were going to see their rankings, they actually worked harder. They did more tasks, they did better at the tasks that they performed, and not only that, but they actually reported enjoying the tasks more than the people who didn't get feedback about how they placed against other people. And so, what we found with the study was that not only does competition impact effort, not only does knowing how well you did relative to others affect how good of a job you do, but also affects how much you enjoy that job. Now, what does that study tell us? What that tells us is that if you uh, allow people the opportunity to compete, 
right? If you structure feedback, if you give them information about how well they did relative to others, they actually enjoy what they do more. What that means is that these sorts of feedback systems are motivating. Right? These bring additional layers of motivation on top of doing the task itself. Now, if you think that's something that's really specific to video games and just a cute little example, think again, because a lot of uh, companies these days are implementing very similar systems to motivate their workers. Companies like Uber, who uh, rate their drivers. Each driver has a rating system, and you can look at how you rate compared to other, uh, other drivers. Um, companies like Facebook allow you to compete against your friends on the platform, um, depending on you know, the number of friends that you have, the size of your network, how well you're doing, where you're vacationing. Social media allows for a lot of these uh, competitive aspects. So not only is this competition pervasive in the workplace, but also in our social lives. Coming back to video games, contemporary games like Fortnite have competition all over them. And if you can imagine how much fun a game of Fortnite would be if you were just playing alone, you'd know how powerful competition really is uh, in our lives. So we've spoken about how video games uh, use feedback to motivate its players to keep coming back. Companies have been using it as well, and there's more examples than what I've mentioned. Uh, but what's interesting is that you can use it too. Now, what I'd like you to do is think about a task that you don't necessarily like to do, uh, things that need to be done, household chores is an example of this, and think about how video, uh, you can use techniques from video games to make those tasks as much fun as possible. Now, we've been doing these sorts of things for a while. It's about turning tasks that you don't necessarily like to do into games, using gold stars, for example, to reward effort in those sorts of tasks. There's many other ways that you can learn from how video games increase motivation and apply it in your own life. So my reward for shooting the video today is to go play some Mario Kart. Bye. everyone and welcome to our lunchtime lab all about aging and the lessons we can learn from the animal kingdom about why we age and how we can grow old more slowly. My name is Dr Elizabeth Duxbury and I work on the evolution and genetics of aging at the University of East Anglia. And I'm Dr Ed Ifemi Cook. I'm also a researcher here at the University of East Anglia and I'm looking at how diet can influence reproduction, health and lifespan. Our study system is a small nematode worm, C. elegans, and it's a really fantastic organism in order to investigate clues about ageing. Here's a fun fact. Did you know that nematodes are all around us? In fact, there are 60 billion of them for every one human on this earth. Wow, <laughs> that really gets you thinking. And across the animal kingdom, animals have very different lifespans. But why is this the case? So to kick off, we will start with our Guess the Lifespan quiz, hosted especially for you by Longevity Liz and Elegan Zed. So for each question, we will show you a picture of an animal, and in each case, we want you to name the animal and guess its average lifespan. Have a think about whether you can get any clues on how long the animal might live based on the environment where it lives, or any facts you know about its biology or behaviour. There will be nine questions in total, and once we have been through all the questions, we will reveal the answers to you and describe what we can learn about ageing from these animals. So here is question one. So here is question two. And this is question three. Remember, we want the animal and its average lifespan. And here is question four. 
And now on to question five. Question six. And for this one, we want both A and B. See if you can work out the difference between them. And this is question seven. And now on to question eight. And finally, this is question nine. So the first answer is an African elephant and its average lifespan in the wild is 56 years, although some estimates can vary. So the answer to question two is the bowhead whale, which can amazingly live for up to 200 years. So question three was the weasel and its average lifespan is only one to two years. So question four is a little easier and this is of course the lovely little hedgehog. But did you know its average lifespan is only two to three years on average in the wild? So, next question, question five, the answer was the naked mole rat and its average lifespan is 30 years. Next question, number six, was probably quite a tricky one. Now these are in fact a fungus growing termite. And letter A, this is the queen, and they can live amazingly for around 15 to 20 years on average. In stark contrast, letter B, these are the workers, and they can only live for around two to three months on average. And question seven was the Seychelles warbler, which has a surprisingly long life for a bird of five and a half years on average. Although amazingly, some individuals can live up to a grand old age of 18 years. Next up, question eight, was actually probably a bit of a trick question. And now this is in fact the immortal jellyfish. And scientists reckon these could be incredibly long lived. In fact, they could almost be immortal. And finally, the last question, question nine, is our study species, the nematode worm C. elegans, and it has an average lifespan of 12 to 17 days under standard conditions in the lab. And speaking of which, let's take you over to our nematode lab and introduce you to the nematodes. Welcome back everyone and welcome to the second part of our lunchtime lab session. I'm actually inside our research lab itself where we use the nematode worm C. elegans in order to answer various questions about why we age and how we could possibly delay the aging process. Now we use, as I said, the study system C. elegans, a small nematode worm which measures one millimeter from head to tail. And in order to use them for our experiments, we end up having to use these high powered light microscopes. Luckily enough, Liz is using one right now in order to look at some nematodes. So Liz, why are nematodes so useful for studying aging? Hi Ed, yes, that's a good question. So these nematode worms are easy to rear up in the lab. Naturally, they feed on bacteria that grows on rotten plants in the soil, and they can also be found on compost heaps. So we can grow this bacteria up on these pe small Petri dishes and feed it to the worms. Importantly, just like we do, worms also change as they get older. But as worms have a much shorter lifespan, we can study how they age much more simply and quickly. You can see the results of your experiments in just a few weeks. That's great. So can you tell us a little bit more about what happens to the worms as they get older? Yes, so the worms actually have several easily identifiable features of aging. They start moving more slowly and usually just move their head and tail in old age. They can also shrink in size, become paler coloured, start showing signs of damage in their intestine and they often have a straighter body posture. In this video you can first see a young worm and then an old worm. As these worms you can see are transparent we can easily look inside them with a microscope. Indeed. And what's more, worms also produce lots of offspring very quickly. Strangely, most C. elegans are hermaphrodites, which means each individual is both a male and female, and they self-fertilize their own eggs with the sperm they produce before they produce up to 300 offspring in the first three days of their adult life. Whilst we mainly use adult worms in our experiment, these worms begin life as an egg. 10 to 12 hours later, these eggs will then hatch into tiny first stage larvae which will continue to grow in size until they become late fourth stage larvae. 
We can tell these are late fourth stage larvae due to the presence of a flower-shaped structure in the middle of the worm's body. This is typically the stage, just prior to adulthood, in which the worms will be picked for our experiments. As it just takes three days from an egg being laid to the adult emerging, this means we can build up a large population of worms to work on very quickly. Yes, indeed. Nematode worms certainly have many features that make them an ideal model system for study and aging, and many of these techniques would be much more difficult in mice or other mammals. What's more, interestingly, there are a number of ways we can extend the lifespan of these worms quite dramatically. We can easily change their diet, environment or genetics to make them long-lived and stress-resistant and then measure the effects on their health, such as their reproduction or their movements. We can also study the genetic health of their offspring. This is particularly useful as worms share some important genes with humans that function in similar ways to control processes related to ageing. So Ed, can you tell us all a little bit more about what your research investigates? So my work involves using a technique called dietary restriction where I reduce the amount of food available to the worms during the early stages of their adulthood. And we find that dietary restricted worms have reduced reproduction, but end up having longer lifespan as a result. And that this effect can really persist over multiple generations from parents to offspring. Wow, that's fascinating. So Liz, can you tell us a little bit more about the research that you do? Yes, so for my work, I investigate how we can use genetics to extend the lifespan of the worms and we look at what effect this has on the quality of the offspring they produce. I'm particularly interested how individuals take in resources from their food and then divide it up across the different bodily processes like growth, reproduction and repairing any damage. I'm particularly curious whether parents that invest more resources into keeping their body in good condition may have less resources to invest into the quality of their offspring. So far we see that this doesn't seem to be the case and parents can keep their bodies in good condition and also produce good quality offspring as well. But we're curious whether there's any hidden costs of this lifespan extension. That's really cool Liz. So now let's look at some more videos. Firstly, here is a reminder of what worms look like as they get older. We can see that this worm is moving slower and often only moves its head and tail. Then in this second video, we see a worm of the same age, but where genetics has been used to extend its lifespan. What do you notice? At the same age as the old worm, see how youthful and lively it is. This worm has a change in a gene called DAF2 and can live twice as long as wild-type worms. This is like a human living to over 170 years old. So we really can use techniques in the lab to delay ageing in our worms, with the aim of ultimately informing research on how humans can live more healthily into their old age too. Certainly food for thought. So that's all for today. We've shown firstly the huge variation in animal lifespans in the natural world, and we've also looked at what lessons these animals can teach us about why we age. We next brought you all over to our research lab to show you how useful nematode worms can be, both for study and ageing, and how we might be able to delay the ageing process. So we really hope that you continue to explore ageing. So that's all from me, Alleganz Ed. And from me, Longevity Liz. Goodbye. Bye.